Tonight's story begins at the heart of British government in Whitehall. Don't worry, we're not going all political. The man I'm after started his working life behind these impressive portals as a pen pusher for Her Majesty's Treasury. But then he thought of a much more interesting way of building up his own exchequer. He shaved his head, started one of Britain's most successful pop groups and has been writing hits for more than three decades. This year, he made an outstanding contribution to a film about some redundant steel workers who give a strip show audience the full Monty. I believe in miracles Since you came along You said something It's all right, you can open your eyes again now. In the 70s, our man and his group had over 30 hits. In fact, they were in the charts for every year of the decade an accomplishment equaled by Elvis Presley and Diana Ross. After that, he went solo, and now he's back in the charts. And tonight, he's singing some of his greatest hits down there in an Oxford Street record store. Where are you from? You sex a thing. Sex a thing, you. Today also happens to be his birthday. I've got a rather special present for him. I heard you singing my song, and uh, I had to pop in to say happy birthday and congratulations on all the success, and to add that Errol Brown of Hot Chocolate tonight, this is your life. I don't know how you haven't got this together. But anyway. That sounds like a good song title. Isn't it? <laughs> anyway, are you set? Shall we split? Let's split. Thank you. See Bye. you. Now we've got, as you can see, the full Monty for you here, the Errol Brown fan club, family and friends, including your aunties Joyce and Lynn. And about to join us, the woman who was the inspiration for your most romantic songs, the girl you married 21 years ago, Jeanette. So, Jeanette, the secret is out. It's been quite a week, hasn't it? Yes, very stressful. Beats any diet. <laughs> <laughs> now, for 16 years, starting from 1970, you were the creative force of hot chocolate. As the group's singer-songwriter, you became the most successful black British male artist ever. Your distinctive voice and gift for writing commercial numbers produced a string of hits, songs that are being discovered by a whole new generation of fans. Emma, Emily Brown talent is passed on to the present generation. Your elder daughter is studying percussion at City University, and your younger daughter wants to be a singer. They're here, of course, Colette and Leonie.
Now, Errol, your success over the three decades has been followed closely by a certain disc jockey of this parish. In my heart, you'll always be the singing Malteser. <laughs> From Capital Radio, Chris Tarrant. Happy birthday, man. You have Now, Chris, <laughs> you claim to have starred on Top of the Pops yes. with Errol. Well, it was, it was the height of Tiswas, and uh, we had our hit, Bucket of Water song, which you've probably got in your collection. No, <laughs> apparently not. And, and we were on between, between Errol Hot Chocolate and, and the Nolans, which is a good place to be. And um, Errol was... Because they didn't treat us very seriously as musicians, I don't know what, and Errol was the only person who was incredibly nice to us. And, and, and when we were waiting for our bit, which is frankly embarrassing when we did it, Errol did his bit, and, and, and you know, there was Hot Chocolate singing the, the chorus or whatever. I think it was started with a kiss. And he had the white suit on. <laughs> And there was this beautiful big close-up with a light shining on the back of his head and someone said, that's a real pop star. And I said, no, that's a singing Malteser. <laughs> <laughs> and he is no, what, such... what he doesn't know is that I've been sponsored by Maltesers for many years. I have made you a fortune! <laughs> <laughs> he is such a nice guy and I'm delighted it's happening all over again. Thank it's brilliant. You Great to see Thank you, Chris. Well, thanks to the fantastic success of the film, The Full Monty, and its soundtrack, your songs are getting a whole new lease of life. The re-released collection of your greatest hits has just won a platinum disc and has found a whole new audience. No one's been more delighted at your renewed success than an old friend who is part of rock and roll history, Rolling Stone, Bill Wyman. <laughs> Kind of you. God bless you, man. God bless you. Here it is. It's my man. You know that. Yes. The bass player of all time. And he's not come empty well, handed. God bless you. Uh, Thank you. Look at that. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. The music's still very kind. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's take it from the top, deep breath. Errol Ainsworth Glenster Brown, this <laughs> is your life. An only child, you were born at the Jubilee Hospital, Kingston, Jamaica. Your father, Ivan Hector Brown, was a corporal in the Jamaican Army. He had a talent for music. He played trumpet, piano and trombone. But your late mum, Edna Maud, brought you up on her own. Determined to do the best that she could for you, she left to find work in England, leaving you, at the age of eight, in the care of two aunts. One of them now lives in Florida, but she's flown in to be with you tonight, your Auntie Mary. <laughs> now, one day, the, uh, the young Errol had to be rushed to hospital, didn't he? Yes. Errol played with his pencil one day, and uh, <laughs> the pencil snapped. <laughs> the pencil, As usual. The pencil snapped, and a portion of it was left in his ears. <laughs> I rushed him to the hospital, only to discover, while he was there, that there was his adenized were swollen, and his tonsils were also swollen as well. An operation followed. The pencil point was removed. So was the adenoids and the tonsils. <laughs> uh, doctor uh, checked me out for tonsillitis and said there was a large portion of, of, of my tonsils been, was removed. So that's why I can hit those high notes. I believe in miracles. <laughs> <laughs> now I can be Yet told. Yes, it did not <laughs> damage his singing voice I'm taking credit for. And <laughs> Thank you. His way. mother had a beautiful singing voice which Harold inherited. I cherish for years the times when he sang Away in a Manger at Torrington Baptist Church one Christmas. Thank, Mary, you, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Now,
Now, your mother worked in London as a secretary, but by taking several evening jobs as well, she saved up enough money to set up a comfortable home. And when you were 11, she sent for you to join her. At first, you live in Alexandra Drive, Gypsy Hill in South London, and then go to the local secondary modern. But then your mother buys a house in Hillfield Road in West Hampstead, and by working round the clock, manages to send you to a private school, Warwick House. When you leave school, you go on to Ealing College to do a course in business studies. And then tragically, when you were 19, your mother, after all her hard work and dedication, died of cancer at the age of 38. And you've said that her death affected the way you've tried to live your life. Yes, of course, because um, she sacrificed so much. Well, your mother left you the family home in Hillfield Road, and you fill the house with your friends, some staying, some passing through, and others just crashing out. And air ho, your cooking was the talk of British West Hampstead. You've been friends since you were teenagers, now she's an actress, Valerie Murray. <laughs> Valerie, would you say that Errol was cordon bleu? His one and only no. talent was... Beans on toast. Be beans on <laughs> toast! <laughs> Whichever friend came by, they could always be sure of a feast of beans on toast. <laughs> Errol, you're the best friend anyone could ever hope to have. Thank you. And I have wonderful memories of our fun time together. Yes. This is my... She knew me, the only person who knew me when I had hair. <laughs> And I've got the and photographs. Which <laughs> she's banned from ever showing to anybody. Thank you, Valerie. Thank, Thank you. you. So after college, you go out into the big wide world. Well, as far as Whitehall, anyway. You become a clerical officer in Her Majesty's Treasury. Your working day is full of pens, paper and ping pong. Do I get the impression the workload wasn't too taxing? No, it was one of the greatest jobs I ever had. <laughs> yeah, be because... Um, I had nothing to do, and I had an assistant to help me to do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was wonderful. So that meant that my table tennis became very good indeed. Well, your involvement with pop music started when you teamed up with a friend, Tony Wilson. In 1969, you make a reggae version of the Lennon and McCartney song, Give Peace a Chance. But you'd altered the lyrics, so to get the all clear from the man who wrote the song, you sent a tape to John Lennon. He was delighted with your version and suggested you release it as a single. But there was a small problem. You were a band with no name. And I was the person who called you hot chocolate. She was a PR girl with the Beatles company Apple, Mavis Smith. Um. Uh, well, Mavis, where did the name uh, come from? Completely out of the blue, as most of the good ideas do. I was travelling to my office on the um, Piccadilly line, up the escalator, when the hot chocolate band flashed into my brain. So the first thing I said to my boss, the late Derek Taylor, was, what about hot chocolate band? Yes. There we brilliant. go. Yeah, it was a brilliant name. Yeah, well, I loved it when I heard later it. Later you abbreviated it yeah. to hot chocolate, yeah. which was fine. And that's my small claim to fame. Well, it's a big claim. <laughs> I've always wanted to know what you look like. Well, here Thank I you. am. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Your first record didn't make it in the charts, but it was an instant hit with one DJ. As soon as I heard your voice, I knew you'd make it one day. In those days, he was working for Radio Luxembourg. He's another capital fellow, David Jensen. Wow. <laughs> David, you, you were in, in the start of Errol's career. Yeah, I remember in 1969, as uh, Errol well knows, John Lennon enthusing about, uh, about the band. And it was a novelty at the time, the sort of reggae uh, band. It was very original, it was very refreshing. The cover version was terrific. So when Apple sent a promotional copy, I got on it uh, straight away and played it. And I knew, as I just said, the man was going to be a, a big hit maker. Yes, fantastic. Thank you very much. Yeah. Indeed. Well said. Thank you, David. Thank you.
1970, with you as lead singer, hot chocolate release, Love is Life, which reaches number six in the charts. It marks the start of 16 years in which your singles are constantly in the top 20. The band becomes a semi-permanent fixture on top of the pops, alongside the resident dancers, Pan's People. Here tonight, Pan's Persons, Babs Powell, Dee Dee Wilde, Ruth Pearson and Louise Dobson. Girls, thank you for making a happy man very old. <laughs> uh, Errol's music was, uh, well, it made your job easy, didn't it, Babs? Oh, yes. Uh, Hot Chocolate's music was just perfect to dance to. And we still do, perhaps not thank professionally, you. but we're still, we were thank dancing you. back there. And weren't they sexy? Look, they're still sexy. Oh, Look Errol. Yes. Oh, he's good. <laughs> <laughs> happy birthday. Thank you very much. Yes, happy birthday, thank Errol. I think we'd better break Brilliant. this up. Thank you very much. <laughs> you thank you. Thank you. June 17th, 1974, was a day to write a song about. It's the day that you met Jeanette. And I engineered that first meeting. He's flown in from his home in Lanzarote, your good friend uh, Phil Tibber. My goodness. <laughs> How are you doing, man? Phil Tibber. How are you? <laughs> long time, long time. Now, Phil, how do you claim the credit? Oh, Errol and I have been friends for a long time. And I had a club called Girl that was in the West End. And I uh, had a big problem because he was getting all the best looking birds. Oh. So I had to get him married off. Oh. And then one day I met Jeanette and I swear to you, I just knew. And I arranged for her to come down the club one night when you were going to be there, as you know. And I put them on adjoining tables and let's see if the magic works. And, and it did? So yeah. It did. It did. Phil, thank you, thank very, you much. very much. Thanks, Good Phil. to see you. Nice to see you. Thank Good you. To see you. Right, let's pick up the story. Jeanette, this first meeting, tell us about it. Oh, no. Phil <laughs> <laughs> had just come back from Nassau, Bahamas, on, on holiday, and there was a very big record in the charts at the time called Nassau's Gone Funky, which was being played. And the first words Errol ever spoke to me were, you should go to Nassau, you'd really like it. Well, I never heard of it. I thought it was the name of another nightclub. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I said, what time does it close? <laughs> Anyway, I actually, I'd lived in Germany the prior two years, and I'd never heard of hot chocolate. And then he told me he was a singer, and I thought, hmm, aren't we old here? <laughs> Still, as Phil Tibber predicted, the chemistry worked, and you got married on December the 11th, 1976, in Notre Dame Church, Leicester Square. We have one of your bridesmaids here tonight, Daphne Marcel. But, uh, Jeanette, Earl's actual proposal came out of the blue, didn't it? Yes, it did. Um, we'd actually booked a holiday to go to Nassau, Bahamas, <laughs> on the 15th of December. Is it open? <laughs> <laughs> and um, three weeks prior to that, Errol said to me, well, if you can arrange a wedding in three weeks' time, we might as well make it a honeymoon. I don't believe he thought that I could actually pull it off. And I, re I never moved so fast. <laughs> <laughs> and just to be matey, two of the members of Hot Chocolate came on honeymoon with you to the Bahamas. Uh, the group's keyboard player doubled as your best man. He must have had a good time because he's now settled in Nassau and he sends you this message. Larry Ferguson. Errol, you've been like a brother to me. In fact, I think of you as a brother. And we have had some great times on the road in these past 16 years. This is merely a sample of your writing and our hits that we've had. Your voice, your songwriting, and your unmistakable shiny head has set us apart from the others. And I hope you have a wonderful evening with Jeanette and the girls. Take care. Bye. And tonight, Larry is represented here by his daughter, Tamara. Your daughters, Colette and Leonie, were both born on the same date, October the 26th, but two years apart, in 1977 and 1979. Colette, uh, what are your first memories of your dad? Well, um, he always... <laughs> 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 Nothing bad. Um, now, he always used to um, walk around the house singing to himself quite a lot. And um, I always used to think he had an absolutely amazing voice. 
but I didn't actually realise how famous he was until I first saw him on telly when I was about seven years old. And Leonie? Well, up until about the age of ten, I thought that he was, I knew he was famous, but I thought that he was more or less the average father. So the first time I went to see you in concert, and I just looked at you and I just thought, wow, he is wicked. And that's when I realised <laughs> how you're, famous he was. You'll get your pocket money next <laughs> Thank week. Thank you. <laughs> Jeanette Errol's always been very proud of the girls, hasn't he? Yes, he has. And actually, the first time he went to see Colette play in her school orchestra, and she got behind the drum kit and started to play in this amazing performance, and he was grinning from ear to ear, and he was so proud. He was nudging people next to us, going, that's my daughter. <laughs> that's my daughter. <laughs> now, Mike Batt, you know about hit records. What makes Errol's songs so enduring? Well, he has something in uh, common with the great Tamil Motown writers, which is that he can take a sincere and soulful idea and combine it with a strong commercial hook and, and rhythm and without sounding at all um, contrived or false. And what comes across when he performs these songs is what you get when you meet him, which is a, a lot of um, style and sophistication combined with a kind of earthy quality and a great sense of humour. I love him. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> right, Bill Wyman, how would you define Errol as a singer? I think his, uh, his character comes out through his songs and his music. You always uh, know it's Errol the moment you hear it. And, uh, but I know him more as a cricketer, actually. <laughs> <laughs> we did a lot of charity games together and had a lot of fun. And um, I send all my regards from all the lads Thank to you. you tonight as well. Thank you. One of your sporting heroes is at the moment in Pakistan, where he happens to be managing the West Indies cricket team. A message from the great Clive Lloyd. Hi there, Errol. Greetings from the West Indies cricket team in Wawalpindi, Pakistan. I do admire you tremendously, there's no doubt about that. Your sartorial elegance, your music, which is cool, very stylish. You're a wonderful individual and a great family man. The whole West Indies team do send you greetings and hope that yourself, Jinnit, and the wonderful daughters of yours do have a great evening. Bye. Bye. And uh, Clive Lloyd's wife, Waveney, is here tonight. We caught up with another of your sporting idols as he was preparing for an important match, but they're all important when the team is Manchester United. Alex Ferguson. Hello, Errol. I hope you have a great night tonight. I'm always saying to my players, be the best, be consistent, just as you've been for many years now, with all your great hits, which everyone's enjoyed. And you're saying everyone's a winner? Well, that's exactly what it's about. On behalf of everyone in Manchester United, to you, Jeanette and the family, I wish you a great night tonight and enjoy it. In the late 80s, you became a sporting figure in your own right as a racehorse owner. Your star chaser, Gainsay, carries your orange and black colours to victory in major races at Cheltenham and then Aintree. Second, the Bilbo third is Gainsay. As they come to the line, Gainsay has won it. Golden Friend has got up to be... Thundering down the M4 to be with you tonight, your winning jockey, Mark Pittman, with your trainer, his mother, Jenny Pittman. <laughs> Now, Mark, you're a trainer yourself now, but you remember that race, of course. I'd had a real tough time with injury, and it was testament to, to Errol and Jeanette that they still had the faith in me to do the job. And uh, it gave me a real buzz, and, and we had tremendous fun with the old horse. He, he ran in two Grand Nationals for us, uh, and it was fantastic time for me. Jenny, you had more trouble with Errol's wife than with the horse. <laughs> what, what was wrong with Jeanette? <laughs> Well, we all stand around in the parade ring before a race and we discuss how the horse is and how the jockey's going to ride the horse. Um, the only problem was, because Jeanette is so stunningly good-looking, as soon as she walked in the paddock, the jockeys used to <laughs> quickly look at Jeanette and prick their ears like a greyhound that had just seen a rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great honour to be here tonight. Not only has Errol been a good owner to us, he's also a very genuine and warm person and a very nice man. Thank you both very much.
Now, back to showbiz. Two of your biggest and best-known fans are currently on tour. We caught up with them at the Theatre Royal, Norwich, Glynis Barber and Dennis Waterman. Errol, me old mate, how are you? Uh, listen, I know this is the only time we've ever spoken to each other, except on the cricket field where we haven't had a drink, of course. So um, I'm going to have a large one for you later if you have a large one for me, you sexy thing. <laughs> I've got to go because she's ready and I'm not. Tell her, mate. Happy birthday, Errol. Uh, I hope you're coping with the surprise. I'm sure you are. I wish I could be there with you on your special night. Uh, you were there for me on my first night. And here I am in Norwich. I believe you're going to be here soon. We keep going to the same venues but missing on our tours. Anyway, um, I'll just say to you what I probably wouldn't say to you to your face, and that is you've been a wonderful friend, very loyal. We've had a lot of laughs over the years. In fact, uh, most of the laughs I've had in the last 10 years have been in your company. <laughs> so I send you lots of love. Have a wonderful evening. Big kiss. Mwah. The revival of all your old hits has come as a pleasant surprise to some people who've known you for years. I knew you were cool. I didn't know you were this cool. A pal for many years, Glynis Barber's husband and the other half of Dempsey and Makepeace, Michael Brandon. <laughs> so Errol surprised you, did he? Actually, my wife surprised me. I didn't know you had so many laughs at my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so, actually, um, yes, he did surprise me. I came over to do the series, Dempsey Make Peace. He didn't know what I did. I didn't know what he did, but uh, Mr. Gold, Johnny Gold there, who was my first friend here, he introduced me to my second friend, Errol Brown. We became great mates, and like Glenna says, we had lots of laughs ever since. But he's a shy guy. You know. <laughs> he's shy, you know. I never heard him hum in 13 years. <laughs> So all of a sudden, Jeanette calls and says, you know, the song's out. I could never find it on the radio. So uh, the concert, I go to the concert, and um, I love you anyway, but when I saw that, I was blown away. Thank you. So good. Terrific. Thank you very much. Michael, thank you. Now, Errol, at the beginning of your story, we heard how your mother had left you in the care of two of your aunts when she left Jamaica to build a new life for you in London. You've already met Aunt Mary. You haven't seen the other one for 19 years, but she's flown in from Kingston to be with you tonight. Aunt Dolores. <laughs> Like your mother, you have developed a beautiful singing voice. How she would have loved to be here and to have witnessed your achievements. Congratulations, blessings. Thank you. Errol Brown, this is your life. Paintings in Making Masterpieces on BBC Two in the shape of a brush. And here on BBC One, EastEnders is in half an hour. After here and now, which is next? <laughs> <laughs>